Diana had warned me that if I could prove that a success in is to be the president of the next dance. And I think that's true. Thank you, Diana, very much for that wonderful and rousing privilege. It's quite a delight to welcome all of you here to the Presidential Music Church tonight. I'm happy to see old friends and new friends and church members all gathered here together. Wendy uh, and I were first when they first talked to me about the sharing the NIV committee in the Southeast Conference. And they talked about Uh, is it a battery issue? <laughs> Woo, okay. You don't want me to start. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, if you have not yet connected with, uh, with your hosts, with those of you you're hosting, who are hosting people, you'll have an opportunity to do that after the worship service. And um, if you need help, see, see me or see Lyle, wave your hand back there. Or Barbara could probably help you, you know, too. Yep. Yeah. So um, just a, a, couple of, a couple of announcements. First of all, just to introduce you to a couple of church staff members who are here. Diana Riggs, uh, our brand new director of music. Uh, so delighted to, to have her here. Martha Ferlenza is in the back, and she is the Jane of all trades or something. She's our church administrator. Laura Reister is working sound for us tonight. And we have a couple of several council members here. If you're on the council of Pleasant Hill Community Church, raise your hand. Wonderful council representation. Thank you all for being here. And I know that you're looking forward to our day tomorrow, and so I will go ahead and introduce you to the Reverend Dr. Marie Fortune, who will be doing our workshop tomorrow. Yep, thank you. Uh, let's see. Afterwards, we have just an informal time of conversation we'll, that will be out in Boyce Hall, just right out here outside the sanctuary. Um, stick around as long as you like, within reason, and um, uh, in, enjoy one another's company, get to know people. Uh, if one of the reasons for having this retreat here was to foster these relationships, go for it. You know, start, start getting to meet people and, and know people. Um, Susan Pummel has, where's Sue? Susan here? She was here earlier. She, she thought maybe some of you might be interested in finding out a little bit more about the Uplands Village community that, that surrounds the church. And so she's arranged for, for anyone who is interested to have a tour tomorrow at 4.30 after we finish the, um, the boundary training workshop. So um, if you're interested in that tour, stick around in, in the setting tomorrow and we'll make sure that you get to, to the right people. A couple of things about our service tonight. Uh, the first is that the hymns, you don't have to mess with hymn, hymn books. The hymns are in your, um, your bulletin, and they're close to in the right order. <laughs> not, not exactly in the right order, but they're, they're very close. We will be, be uh, sharing communion together. Uh, Reverend Paul Agnes Tucker is our, our celebrant for the evening, and we will be serving by intinction. So when at the appointed time when you're invited to come, we invite you to come. And Paul, are we serving people? Okay, so, so we, if you want to serve yourself, put your hands out and we, we will make sure that you can serve yourself. Otherwise, the, we, will, we will serve you. And um, this is this grape juice. We have um, gluten-free rice crackers that have not in, been in the proximity of bread at all. And, um, and we have bread that, that has gluten in. So, um, so make sure that you, you tell us what you need when you come to receive communion this evening. Just to kind of get us going, uh, I invite you to rise. You can, you can have your words in front of you. Just a little kind of icebreaker song. It's, this is a John Bell song. If you know John Bell from the Iona community in Scotland, it goes, it's around. It goes like this. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. You want to try? Now, the, each phrase starts a note higher. So, God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. We'll do 
do it several times. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. One more time and then we'll do it around. Ready? And God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never had friends. God welcomes all never ends. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. It never ends. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> and we are called to welcome. Uh, call to worship that God. All you who are thirsty, this is the place for water. All you who are hungry, this is the place to be fed. Why spend your earnings on what is not food? Here, oh, why pay for that which fails to satisfy? Here, without money, here, without price, all may enjoy the bread of heaven. God is still speaking. All who hear will have life. Gather in this place, new light is streaming. Now is the darkness vanished away. See in this place our fears and our dreamings brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty. Gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the song. Here we will take the wine and the water. Here we will take the bread of new birth. Here you shall call your sons and your daughters. Call us anew to be salt for the earth. Give us to drink the wine of compassion. Give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. <clears throat> Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away but here in this place the new light is shining now is the kingdom now is the day gather us in and hold us forever gather us in and make us your own gather us in 
peoples together, fire of our love in our flesh and our bone. You may be seated. From the Odd and Wondrous Calling by Lillian Daniel. Where else can you be invited into living rooms of new mothers and into hospice rooms of the dying and find hope in both places? I do love being a minister. I love the agility it calls forth and the chaos that only Jesus could organize into a calling. But mostly I love those moments when from the position of paying holy attention to my own community of faith, I notice the power and presence of God. There are moments when we are practicing our faith together in ways that have become ordinary. But God's grace breaks in and we realize we are a part of something extraordinary. Somehow God calls us into practicing our faith together. Not so that we will all march in lockstep, but so that we will move like a dance troupe in which each one of us contributes a somewhat different step to the unfolding work and beauty. Practicing our faith is like a dance. Each event is unique and unrepeatable, but we are moving in patterns and steps of a tradition and a people. We are called to dance together, not just with those we meet in this life, but with a cloud of witnesses and a slew of saints from our past and future. We work at it and practice for the gift that every now and then we are soaring, doing what we are called to do. Beauty for brokenness, hope for despair. Lord, in this suffering world, this is our prayer. Bread for the children, justice, joy, peace. Sunrise to sunset, may your realm increase. miracle of God comes not only from above, it also comes through us. It is also dwelling in us. It has been given to every person and it lies in every soul as something divine and it waits. Calling, it waits for the hour when the soul shall open itself, having found its God and its home. When this is so, the soul will not keep its wealth to itself but we'll let it flow out into the world. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Oh God, we give you our hands to do your work. We give you our feet to go your way. We give you our eyes to see as you do. We give you our tongues to speak your word. We give you our minds that you may influence our thoughts. We give you our hearts that you may love in and through us. We give you our whole selves that you may guide us so that it is you, O oh God, who live and work 
and love through us, you in whom we live and move and have our being. God above us, God beside us, God beneath us, the beginning, the end, the everlasting one. May we live in this awareness always. Amen. Shelter for fragile lives, cures for their ills, work for the crafters, trade for their skills, land for the dispossessed, rights for the weak, voices to plead the cause of those who can't speak. From 1 Samuel 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering under Eli. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then God called, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I I did not call you. Lie down again. So Samuel went back and, and lied down. God called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know God. God called Samuel again a third time. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Eli perceived that God was calling the boy and said to Samuel, Go, lie down. If the voice calls you, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Now God came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The voice said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears tingle. Hello? Who? God? Like the God? Oh, God. <laughs> you, you want me to do what? Well, sure, I can do that. Thanks for asking so directly. <laughs> no, I didn't hear your first four calls. Yes, I'll, I'll listen more carefully next time, promise. Um, okay, okay, bye. I, I mean, um, amen, or something. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? If we could hear God so directly. Now, most of us here would probably say that God has called us. But that's something of an elusive thing to explain in rational terms, isn't it? The prophet Isaiah says that God calls us by name. And other places in scripture tell us of those who heard God call them. Moses, Deborah, Saul, the prophets. Mary even recognized the risen Jesus when he called her name. 
Many of us know this endearing story of the boy Samuel. We heard it as children. The background, of course, is that it's been 200 years since God led the people out of slavery to the promised land. A lot has changed during that time. The people have all but abandoned God, have gone their own way. In fact, the book of Judges ends with a chilling moral commentary. It says this, everyone just did as they wanted to do. First insight into this notion of call. God's call is based on the world's need. The world needs to turn and God needs a capable young leader. With the birth of Samuel, there was hope again in Israel, and as soon as he was old enough, his mother Hannah took him to this place of service to God and to Eli, the priest. There we know that God calls directly to Samuel, and Samuel hears, but he doesn't recognize the voice as God. And it had been a while since Eli had heard the voice, so he didn't know what, quite what was going on either. His ears were somewhat out of practice. Samuel's confusion invites us, I believe, to discern carefully the genesis of our calls. Just who is calling us? Is it expectation or our family or our favorite professor? Who is it? When Eli figured it out, did you notice what he did? He, simply, he didn't simply tell Samuel that he wanted to translate the message on God's behalf. Rather, he encouraged Samuel to go back and lie down and listen for himself, for the voice of God. Samuel doesn't just simply follow Eli. He listens for God's call. He was simply being a kid in the temple, never expecting to hear a soul besides Eli. But God spoke, and God spoke again, and then again. Yeah, you're laughing, aren't you? <laughs> yep. In the night, perhaps in dreams, and God spoke in that voice. You know what I mean, don't you? In that voice. That voice just that keeps on and on in my head. It may only say a name or say a task. One night, it kept saying the name Laura, not you, Laura, Laura, Laura. So clearly that I had to pay attention. Laura was a student of mine for many years before. I had absolutely no idea how to contact her, but the voice was insistent. After, after several steps of trying to find her contact information, steps that were a little easier than I had imagined, I called and she answered. After catching up with each other over about 20 years' time, she told me that just two days before her younger sister had been killed in a car accident, Laura said that she couldn't believe that I had called at this time without that voice. I never would have called. That voice that was repeated and subtle. The subtlety is an interesting aspect, I think. At, at a conference that was on the, on the subject of call several years ago, Reverend Susan Bishop, who's a prison, prison chaplain in Atlanta and a Baptist minister, tells what it's like for her to hear God's call. Given the, the profound and effective ministry that Susan has, we were ready for a long and serious story. But Susan says this, Usually I see a need. Most of the time it's a desperate need. And I hear this little voice that simply says, you who Susan, over here. Subtle, what we may not expect. The story of Samuel's call has three main characters, God, Samuel, and Eli. Important, important. God calls Samuel, but Samuel wouldn't have heard in the same way without Eli's help. It takes generations. It takes those who have heard the call before to help us know how to listen. Some of us here are Samuel, the hope of the next generation. And some of us are Eli, well-seasoned, with memories of God to share and to inspire. And so for each of us, as we examine and re-examine, as we ponder and prepare, I want to encourage us all to continue to listen. 
to let others help us hear, to consider the world's great need, and to follow that call with everything in you. We heard the last line of that reading that was so beautifully done. Thank you, Josh. When the boy Samuel hears God's voice, his ears tingle. My prayer for all of us here is that when we hear, we'll all be ministers with tingling ears. May it be so. second reading comes from Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So, earlier in the day, I read a meme, I think that's what they're called, quotes in a box on Facebook, is that what they are? Okay. It was on Facebook this morning, and I have to tell you, it is changing my life. That happens to you, doesn't it? Facebook quotes change your life. Well, let me tell you what this quote said. It said, every time you get dressed, remember that if you die, that's going to be your ghost outfit forever. (laughs) Oh my gosh! (laughs) I suppose it's fairly certain that most of us will get dressed every day, but now we have to pay attention. What to wear if you die today? Takes wearing clean underwear in case you're in an accident to a whole new level. What do you want your ghost outfit to be? We are all called to put on clothes, but what outfits and how are we supposed to know what outfits? That's where discernment comes in. I read a story about an interview that uh, Gregory Peck gave one time that was followed by a question and answer period. And one man rose and he said, my name is Reverend Thomas Jones And I have observed, Mr. Peck, that you have played many times in films the role of a priest. Did you ever contemplate the possibility of becoming a clergyman? Gregory Peck said, I grew up a strict Catholic, attended mass every week, and at the age of seven or eight, I felt a call to be a priest, but I quickly recovered from that and found my vocation as an actor. And after the audience laughed, the clergyman said, pardon me for saying this, Mr. Peck, but I believe that God has blessed us more through your vocation as an actor. Some people find their ghost outfits easy to assemble. I was amazed that my children knew basically before they went off to college what they wanted to do and what they wanted to study. Now they took a few twists and turns, but they discerned early in their lives what direction they wanted to pursue. I, on the other hand, still am trying to figure it out. So I'm getting a pretty clear picture of what I want my ghost outfit to be. I can see hats and scarves and belts and boots in my future and elastic waistbands. Now, the dictionary says that discernment is the ability to see and understand people, things, or situations clearly and intelligently. That's pretty straightforward. 
And it seems a little bit like saying that success is following a straight line from point A to point B, when we all know that what success looks like is this tangled mess between point A and point B. So I found another definition, one that I forgot to cite. And as you young people coming up, don't do that. Do as I say, not as I do. But this definition says, discernment is a process by which we are helped to reach a decision in the light of faith and in the context of our personal reality and the realities of the world in which we live in. Discernment involves trying to identify what is of God, what is for our full happiness and for others, and distinguishing or separating that from what is not of God or from what is simply driven by our ego, societal expectations, family, or peer pressure, or even the church. Now, you can't talk about discernment in church circles without quoting Frederick Beekner, who said much the same thing in his own way. He said, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. For God is in the hunger, and where God is, is where we are are called, but where do they intersect? To find out, I am suggesting that we need to know ourselves. I want you to ask yourself, what makes you get up in the morning? What makes you choose a ghost outfit that makes you smile? What saves you? And pardon me, but please don't say Jesus saves. For you see, if I think if that's the only answer you can give, you still have work to do. Because once you discern the intersection of your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger, then the real work of salvation that God is calling you to begins. God may do the saving, but I can assure you God will make you do the work. So you better know what clothes will go the distance. You need to know what it is that makes your heart sing, what it is that you're willing to sweat for, or what you will give up for. We have to know what it is we're willing to give our lives to, and then look for where the world or the church or our communities, or our families long for transformation. One of my favorite modern pop philosophers is Brian Andreas, the creator of the story people, if you're familiar. One of his short stories is called Invitation. This is what he says. It's not what you first think. There is no effort or will, no firm resolve in the face of this thing called living. There is only paying attention to the quiet each morning while you hold your cup in the cool air. And then that moment, you choose to spread your love like a cloth upon the table and invite the whole day in again. Discernment is about paying attention. Not to what the world says you should do, not even to what the church says you should do, though don't Well, I won't say, but there are some checks and balances to consider. But do not be conformed to this world, but pay attention. Renew your mind. Pay attention to the place where your deep gladness, where your ghost outfit makes you make a little skip, and pay attention to the world's deep hunger and where they meet. That is the place 
where you are called to spread your love like a cloth upon the table and invite the world in. There, at this table, you are transformed and others will be transformed by God through you. Pay attention. Thank you. Lord, have mercy. From Matthew 25, verses 1 through 10. Then the realm of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. 
When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout. Look, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourself. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. During one of my first Easter's as a local church minister, in the wee hours of the morning, I had a dream, or perhaps a nightmare. I'll let you be the judge. As we revisit, well, my self-conscious and the cultural mores that are growing increasingly, thankfully, obsolete. I consider the dream a tribute to my grandmother. In this dream, I was racing out of the door of my home for the 1015 service at 1010 <laughs> and discovered that I was wearing black stockings, completely inappropriate for Easter Sunday. And I didn't even know about ghost outfits. <laughs> A dilemma, be on time wearing the wrong attire or be late for Easter service, dream or nightmare. Fortunately, I did not have to make the difficult decision because I was asleep. <laughs> Yet all of us are faced with quandaries like this dream and the predicament of the so-called foolish wedding attendants in the parable. Occasions when we feel ill-equipped for a situation when we have to choose between being present or feeling unprepared. Can you recall a time when you were faced with such a dilemma? Another long ago memory. One summer when I was in seminary on Manhattan's Upper West Side, I worked as the chapel's space coordinator. Now there's a job title for a ministerial profile, space coordinator. Tried to explain that. <laughs> Basically, I opened the doors, turned on the lights, made sure there were enough candles for weddings and other special events. By the way, it's not a good idea to steam the pyramids while they are on the communion table. <laughs> At one wedding, all of the guests had gathered, as had one member of the wedding couple. Moments before the stated hour, the phone in the chapel office rang. The bride and some attendants were running late. They were at Midtown on the east side, but would get there as quickly as possible after they picked up some shoes. I went down to the chapel and reported this information, or some of it, to the gathered people and returned to the office. Short while passed, the phone rang. This was before cell phones. They had the shoes and were getting in a cab about to cross to the west side. They had to pick someone up. I went downstairs, reported this information to the gathered guests. This cycle repeated itself several more times. Two and a half hours after <laughs> the time the wedding was supposed to begin, both members of the wedding couple were present and the wedding took place. This was a couple with whom I had no prior or subsequent acquaintance, but their story has remained with me for many years. The bride had to choose between being present on time and being ready. 
As she gathered items and people from various points on the island of Manhattan, she became more and more ready. Perhaps she needed that extra 150 minutes to prepare her soul for her marriage. Perhaps she gained security from objects, symbols of polish and propriety, pretty shoes, a ring bearer's pillow, the right colored hosiery, rather than from the strength within her. Like the attendants in the parable, whose lamps were empty, she did not feel what she had what was needed to meet the bridegroom just yet. And she was the spouse, the intended spouse. In the parable, when five of the women discover oil in their lamps is running low, first they ask the other wedding attendants to share. The wise ones do not have enough oil to spare, and so they send the others to the market at midnight to buy some. While they are away, the groom arrives, the wedding banquet begins, and the door is shut. The five guests miss the opportunity for which they had been waiting hours into the wee hours of the morning. An early line of the text reads, five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. If in fact five of the wedding attendants were foolish, I would say their shortcoming was not about empty lamps, but in their decision to leave the scene of the wedding. Their weakness is lack of confidence or lack of self-awareness. Deep within all of us are resources we may not realize we have until we truly need them. Preparation for ministry entails learning to rely on what is within us rather than the resources we carry. The presence of the wedding attendants was more essential than the oil in their lamps. At moments when you feel empty-handed or as if something is missing, trust in who you are. Believe in the preparation of your inner self. Choose to spend time with people who are expecting to who are expecting you. Choose to be present and you will be wise. Amen.
please be seated. Here we are gathered from the far-flung places of our conference, gathered in this historic and holy place on this holy mountain, gathered with friends that are some long time from other dispensations, or maybe with people that we don't even know the name of sitting next to us. And yet, what better symbol than this table? A table that has access from every direction, a table where all are welcome, a table that represents the very essence of who God is and who we are called to be, a place where all come to be fed, not by the church, but by God. We simply get to help hand out the stuff. And it is on this place in this time that we get to be here for such a time as this, as God's gathered people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to begin everything we do with gratitude, for we are a blessed people. We are blessed that we might bless. We have, been, we have received gifts that we might be gifts to our world. And tonight as we come to receive, may we know that grace that is embedded in our hearts and our lives that is freely given to our world. T'was on that sad and doleful night When powers of death and hell arose Against the one of God's delight, and friends betrayed him to his foes. Before the mournful scene began, he took the bread and blessed and broke. What love through all his actions ran, what wondrous words of hope he spoke. This is my body given for you. Receive and eat the living bread. Then took the cup and blessed the wine. For you my precious blood is shed. Do this, he cried, till time shall end. In memory of your dying friend, meet at my table and record the words of your departed Lord. Jesus, thy feast we celebrate. Renew us with your spirit now. Remove our fear, all barriers break. As humbly at your feet we bow. Oh God, we are grateful for this, these gifts. For they remind us that we are gifts of grace and that we have received gifts of grace. As we receive tonight, may our spirits be enlivened with your love and purpose that in the mystery of your wholeness, we may discover our own. In your name we pray. Amen. One of the beautiful things I love about our church is that you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to receive these gifts because they are God's. They're not ours. And so they're freely offered to any who would receive because that's how grace is always offered, freely, to any who would receive, whether they're worthy of it or not. And who of us are worthy of it? And yet we all receive. So I invite you to come by the center aisle to one of two servers. If you would like to receive gluten-free, come to this side. If you don't care what you receive, come to either side. Your ushers will, I mean, your servers will offer you a cup and the bread. If you'd like to receive yourself, just hold out your hands and we'll give you those opportunities. We'll offer a brief blessing and then you can return to your seat. All has been prepared for you. Come.
us is to receive these gifts of God's grace, that they may remind you of God's love and all that you do and are. My sister, receive these gifts of reminding you of God's love living in you and all that you do and are. My brother, receive these gifts as a reminder of God's love in your life. My sister, receive these gifts as a reminder that God's grace lives and grows in you. My brother, receive this holy communion as a sign of God's love living in you. Amen. My brother, receive these gifts as God's love that you may go from this place blessed. Eddie, my brother, receive these gifts these gifts as a reminder that God's grace lives and grows in you. Mm-hmm. My sister, receive these gifts as a reminder that God's love lives and grows in you. Amen. My sister, receive these gifts as a reminder of God's love growing in your life and heart. My sister, receive these gifts as a reminder that God's love lives and grows in you. My sister, receive these signs of God's grace in your life that you may be a grace to those you meet. Donna, my sister, receive these signs of God's love living in you that you may know God's presence in all you do and are. Laura, my sister, receive these signs of God's grace living and growing in you. My sister, receive these gifts of God's grace living and growing in your life. Amen. My sister, receive these gifts, knowing that God's grace lives and grows in through you. Amen. My brother, receive these gifts of God's grace in your life, that you may know that presence in all you do and are. My brother, receive these signs of God's love, that you may go from this place to be a blessing. Amen. Jody, my sister, receive these gifts as a reminder that God's grace lives and grows in you. My brother, receive these gifts as a sign that God's grace lives in your heart and mind. signs of God's grace living in your life that you may be blessed.
Let us pray. For this holy moment, O oh God, we give you thanks. To know your presence that fills our hearts and lives. That reminds us of our center and calls us to our edges. For the opportunity to be together and to know your grace sustaining us every step of our way. We are grateful. In your name we pray. Amen. If you heard the call and responded in service to God within your lifetime, would you please come forward up onto the chancel? Anyone who's been in authorized ministry, anyone who's been in the mission field, anybody who's worked in social justice, if you heard the call and responded, please come up. You are an elder, in other words, in our midst. And if you don't come up, we'll call you out here. Because <laughs> we know who you are. And now the few of you who are left, if you are a member in discernment, we ask you to rise. Or a person in exploration, we ask you to rise. Yeah. Yeah. Double duty. Just as Abraham and Sarah were called to faithfulness, so have you been called. As Job was called to radical trust, so have you been called. As physician and AMA missionary, Dr. May Wharton was called to transform this place from a school to an active retirement community focused on service and social justice, so have you been called. As some here tonight were called to the missionary field for decades, so have you been called. As some here were called to parish ministry, chaplaincy, or social activism. So, have you been called? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. We have heard the call, and we responded. If you are preparing for authorized ministry and wish to reaffirm your response to your call, we ask you to come forward. Now. <laughs> Don't be shy. And, and turn around. And, and stand in front of your elders. Yeah. <laughs> this is it. Dr. May was a healer, a woman of compassion and vision. She was the first person to enter this building upon its dedication. You may have noticed the stones that are used. They're called crab orchard stone and are indigenous to this plateau. As you prepare for your ministry, we want you to have a piece of this place to carry with you as those who have gone before you offer blessings for your time of preparation. Please accept a token of Dr. May's response to God's call and a building block for her ministry. May it be so for yours also. 
May the God of Miriam bring you companions when you struggle. May the God of Hagar bring you comfort in the desert. May the God of Moses enable you to step up when the time is up. May the God of Deborah fortify you with courage for your battles. May the God of David help you to learn to forgive yourself. May the God of John the Baptist help to prepare, prepare your way. May the Christ who sat with Mary and Martha show you the way of balance. May the Christ who healed the bent over woman heal your pain. May the Christ who was anointed by an unnamed woman consecrate your very being. May the Christ of Mary Magdala send you out to proclaim the good news. May the spirit who sustained Priscilla and Aquila instruct you in the way of God. In the name of the Christ, who is the memory, hope, and authority for our future, we send you forth like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. May God bless and keep you, guide and inspire you on your ministry journey. Amen.
It's our tradition here at Pleasant Hill Community Church to be seated to receive the gift of the postlude. This is a gift for this new year.